Today we are going to talk about uh, observability, a term which has become more and more common in the last 10 years. So the title of this article that we have published here is Microservices Observability, but this is also known by other terms. Some may call it, for example, cloud observability. It also means the same thing. Or people may simply say observability. It also means the same thing. But there is a more specific term called data observability that has its own meaning. So we will not cover that today. Today we are talk, going to talk purely on observability, how it applies in a microservices environment. So we'll start by understanding what uh, this term means, how it came about. Then we'll compare this against another more uh, popular term. I wouldn't say popular, more familiar term called monitoring. But there are very important differences between what is monitoring and what is ob observability. So we will try to understand those differences. Then we will look at uh, the key pillars of uh, observability. What are the key pillars? What uh, makes this work? So that is, uh, you know, you can see some idea of that from this diagram here on the screen. Then we'll get into the design patterns. Uh, what are the kind of techniques that people use or designers use to implement uh, observability in their systems? So if you are a developer, if you are a designer or a system engineer, that will be of interest to you. Then finally, we look at some of the tools that the tools and frameworks out there in the marketplace, which kind of help you in implementing observability in, uh, for your own projects. So this would be the you know high level overview of today's talk. And in between, I'll give some pauses for you to ask questions. So now this talk is applicable regardless of whether you are a developer or you are a operations guy or you are a tester. Maybe less relevant for testers, but it is not totally irrelevant, I would say. But the, both uh, ops people as well as developers will uh, definitely benefit from this talk. Okay. So let's start with the uh, high level uh, overview of observability, what it is. So some of you, I mean, we are not going to explain here what microservices are because that is a separate topic by itself. But uh, the term microservices itself was coined around 2011. So it's about 10, 12 years from today. And uh, back then when this term was very new, people were still trying to figure out, you know, how to build microservices applications. Even today, you know, although the term is much more familiar, uh, not everyone is on the microservices uh, mode of working. St some are still sticking to monolith uh, way of working, and there are various reasons. One of the reason is that uh, splitting up uh, uh, splitting up an app into microservices and managing all those microservices. It could be dozens of microservices, or it could be hundreds. Regardless of the kind of scale we are talking about. Managing microservices is not so trivial. So earlier, all your code was in a single monolithic application, deployment, monitoring, logging, everything was simple because it was all installed and deployed together and monitored together. But now things are much more dynamic. So one of the things in Microsoft, the world of microservices is the system is very dynamic. The system is heterogeneous. The parts of the system are loosely coupled. And finally, the system is transient. So what all these terms mean, some of you will already know what these mean. Why is it dynamic? This, uh, the use, it is very simple. The dynamism is also kind of related to transients. So one aspect of dynamism is, let's say you have uh, 100 customers accessing your app. Maybe you have only two instances running. Suddenly there is a peak period and 100 users become 1000 users. It becomes 10,000 users. Now two service instances will not be able to meet the performance measures of the app. So the app is designed in such a way in a microservice environment that it will automatically scale. Instead of two microservices, now suddenly you have 10 microservices or 20 kind of instances running to serve the users. So that is the kind of dynamism and dynamic nature of the app that we are looking at. Heterogeneous, not all microservices are equal. 
some services may be serving the front end more closely other microservices may be interfacing with the database other my, microservices may be making external api calls maybe for for example making a call to google maps api so and not only that microservices can be de designed uh, and implemented in different languages so some services could be based on dotnet others could be based on java spring boot others could be node js so a variety of programming languages and frameworks will be part of your microservices app so now immediately you start seeing you know the challenges then the parts are loosely coupled none of these services is tightly coupled to another service it's perfectly possible to replace one service with another let's say a better implementation has come about so you can replace one service with another and the rest of the app you know stays the same so now all these different parts have to interact with one another and they have to work seamlessly then the last point is transient which is that if a microservice goes down or in the world of kubernetes we call them as pods right so a pod is like the gran most granular unit of uh, deployable unit in a kubernetes cluster and inside the pods you can have containers no no doubt about that so in kubernetes we say the pods are all transient that means a pod can potentially crash it could be something because uh, triggered by the infrastructure or because of something in your application code or something gone wrong in the interface it doesn't matter how it crashed but it can crash and what kubernetes uh, controller will do it will uh, see that pod has crashed and it will automatically bring up a new pod as a replacement for the crashed pod so these are all the different things that you know happen in a microservices environment so the challenges are much more so to give another perspective suppose you have a monolithic app the app is very simple let's uh, even simplify it further by stating that the app has only two states the app is either running or is it, or is it down so it has only two states now any kind of monitoring solution that you put to uh, you know monitor this app in production or try to debug this app in production it's simply very simple if it is up you don't care about it if it is down you start debugging and because there are only two states the whole complexity is uh, reduced so the system is very easy to debug now you let now let's take the same monolithic application and split it into let's say n number of services now each service let's keep it simple let's assume that each service has only two states either the service is running or it is down but now because the app has been split into n microservices the complexity is much more it is no longer 2 instead it is 2 to the power of n because now you have so many different combinations in which services can be up or down so no doubt each service has only two states but the application as a whole now has 2 to the power of n states which means that it becomes much more difficult for you to start to troubleshoot this kind of an app in production that is where observability comes in so i hope you appreciate why observability is important because in the old style of working monolithic applications were generally well understood they were easy to debug easy to troubleshoot even in production and most of the times they will capture everything that is going on into log files and all you had to do is to connect some sort of a viewer with these log files consume these log files and start your analysis so it was as simple as this but in case these log files didn't do the trick you also had the option to log into that machine because remember it's a monolithic application you know exactly where it is running so you have access to the server where this app is running so in the extreme case you can even log into the app you can uh, you know uh, see what's going on on the infrastructure directly you might even be able to put breakpoints and start debugging through your code under certain scenarios so these kind of things are suddenly no longer possible in a microservices environment because first of all it is transient so if the pod has crashed that pod is already gone now you have a completely new pod which doesn't show that problem right then it's loosely coupled it means that 
a particular pod could have crashed, but it could have crashed not because it had some issue, but because it received probably some invalid input from somewhere, which it did not handle properly. But now, how do we know which which, which was the in hand, uh, invalid input? Did it come from another service? Did it come from uh, a user interaction? It is very hard to tell, right? Because there are so many moving parts, so many different microservices running as part of the app. The whole uh, stuff is complex. So that is where you know people started to realize that old style monitoring of an app was no longer. I mean, it is still relevant, but it is no longer adequate for the modern needs of uh, microservices environment. And that's when people started talking about observability. So what is observability? What makes a system observable? At a very high level, can we understand how the system is working inside by looking at what kind of outputs that system is putting out? Or put it another way, can we correlate the outputs of the system with the inputs? So a, a certain API call comes as a response to that API call. A series of API calls are made to different microservices. These microservices maybe access the database, process the data, and give a response back to the original request. So can we correlate all these different requests that are triggered by a single API call? So that is something we want to know. Can we explain unexpected behavior? I will explain this a little bit next, but this is one of the questions that we wish to answer. And finally, can data help us achieve business goals? Right? So these are not easy questions to answer. And if you can answer all these questions, then you can say that your system has become observable. Right. Mind you, a system that is observable doesn't mean that you can go and uh, doesn't mean that, you know, because you asked a new question, you go and change the code. That is not what the definition of observable. I will explain that a little later or we can take it up in the Q&A. OK. So before I give way to Q, uh, give you a chance to ask questions, let's cover the most important question that most beginners ask. What is monitoring and how is monitoring different from observability? So the thing about monitoring is monitoring is not a new term. Right? Monitoring is a term which was born in the 1980s, late 1980s. So if you can see here the timeline of observability as a whole. The term observability was coined in 1960. It, it sounds strange, but actually it came not from computer science. The term came by through the domain of control theory, and it was coined by Rudolf Kalman, who is a well-known uh, researcher, uh, and uh, like he graduated as an electrical engineer. Uh, so his main contribution is in the theory of uh, control theory, uh, con yeah, control theory and dynamics. Whether it's a linear system or non-linear system, he analyzed all kinds of control systems and came up with the formal theory for control systems. So he defined in 1960 that observability is nothing but a measure of how well internal states of a system can be inferred from knowledge of its external outputs. Right? So that means you, you can think of it like this, like your system is kind of a black box, but you are observing what kind of outputs your system is producing. From those outputs, can you figure out what are the internal states of the system? That is what is meant by observability. But that is in the context of control theory. This definition, definition doesn't exactly apply to us in computer science and IT networking. So today, how is this term understood in distributed software systems? So for us, observability is the ability to understand and explain any system state no matter how unusual or expected it may be. Right? So see, when you design the system, you might have designed the system for, let's say, four or five different states. So by default, the system is in one of those four or five different states. But what happens if it gets into some undetermined state which you did not design for? So how would you explain that? 
if you can explain that then you can say that your system has become observable that means you are able to explain things which you never expected when the system was des designed in the first place right so we will understand a little bit more of that but observability as a practice now in computer systems it started only about 10 years back but in the 1980s there was a new protocol which was introduced called a simple network managing uh, management protocol some of you may know it by the acronym snmp right so you have a bunch of uh, devices deployed on the network and you want to monitor the health of each device suppose it's a web server you want to monitor number of requests per second what are the queue sizes what is the response time right what is the cpu utilization on that device on that server what is the memory usage what is the uptime downtime all kinds of things you want to monitor uh, so back back in the late 1980s they invented this protocol called snmp and this snmp captured lots of metrics which related to the infrastructure and these met metrics were basically collated and summaries were shown on dashboards and if a metric exceeded a certain threshold alerts were given and the support staff were supposed to look at these alerts and immediately take action corrective action so an alert could be like there is a sudden downtime or you know suddenly there is extra traffic and the response times are going up so those are kind of alerts or in a iot system for example let's say you are talking about a cold chain iot system where the refrigerator must be within a certain temperature uh, boundaries but if the temperature exceeds a specific value then an alert is triggered so that is a kind of monitoring which i gave an example of monitoring in a iot system so like that there are different systems where monitoring is done and monitoring has been done for so many decades three or four decades since the you know late 1980s let us say and the protocol that enabled that was snmp so people started doing monitoring all through the 1990s you know systems got networked more and more people started getting into the onto the internet right world wide web was getting popular so monitoring was a big thing in the 1990s but nobody talked of observability so one of the first use of the term observability came from sun microsystems when in 1999 they used this term with respect to application performance monitoring and capacity planning unfortunately their definition of observability is closer to what we today understand as monitoring right so today this definite this this is not the observability that you know sun microsystems talked about in 1999 so observability today took shape only in the mid uh, like around 2015 only people started talking about observability and that makes sense because microservices itself was born around 2011 so the history of uh, observability is very much in parallel with the history of microservices microservices started around this time observability started like the first people to talk about observability were the folks at twitter so they started using the term observability in a blog article in 2013 so this is probably one of the earliest references to observability uh, in the world of uh, it uh, computer systems so now we are in 2023 10 years down the line now the term is much more common much more familiar but that does not mean that everybody is practicing observability in fact in terms of actual practice observability is still very new uh, there is not enough maturity uh, even the tools in many cases are not uh, mature enough forget about the practice of using those tools or adopting the best practices among developers and ops uh, people right so this is the history of observability and uh, there are other details which i will not go through but just mention it open telemetry came about in 2019 so that is one of the building blocks from which observability is uh, constructed today then w3c they published uh, what is known as a new document or a recommendation called trace context so which we will i will talk about a little later so that came about in 2021 so you can see this is also fairly new this has been standardized only 2 years back 
So this is the history of observability. So we will discuss a little bit more, but the first questions from anyone. I haven't covered much, but uh, yeah, have you understood a little bit about what is observability? Any questions? Okay, no questions, no issues. We can come back later to Q&A. I, I, I just have to make one point as per my understanding. And that is that from whatever you have told, it seems that uh, monitoring is just a subset of observability. Is my understanding correct? That is correct. Very correct. Yes. In fact, I was going to mention that next. That is correct. I will elaborate on it shortly. Okay, okay so since that gentleman asked, let's get into what is monitoring and what is observability. So monitoring, uh, as we saw, it has been in place for uh, two, three decades. So monitoring is not new. But uh, monitoring, when you do monitoring, you are only monitoring for known unknowns. That means you have some sort of a hypothesis that this ABC can go wrong. If ABC goes wrong, I will throw up an, uh, I will, so I will collect metrics to monitor ABC. And if these metrics, uh, you know, exceed certain threshold, I will trigger alerts. I will do health checks on my servers, on my infrastructure, on my API calls. And for those also, I will define metrics. That means I know where they will fail, what type of failures can occur. So I will monitor those kind of things. And I will, if any of those checks fail, I will trigger an alert. So monitoring was all about this. It was very proactive, but proactive in the sense that you already knew what kind of failures can happen. Right, known unknowns, and it was all built on hypothesis. Whereas in the case of observability is unknown unknowns, because now we have suddenly many more moving parts, many more ways in which services can get interconnected, instances coming up and going down dynamically. You don't know what kind of failures can occur in advance. Right, so that is why people call it unknown unknowns. The nature of the failure itself is not known in advance. So you have no clue how things will fail. So to some extent, uh, observability is trying to understand your app, trying to discover what kind of problems can potentially occur in your app. This is where things like chaos in, uh, testing also matters, like Netflix pioneered that, right? Suddenly you bring down, uh, deliberately you bring down a pod. De deliberately you cut off a connection from one pod to another. How will your system react? Right, because you don't know that in advance. That is kind of an unknown unknown. You don't know how your services are going to react. What kind of things will go wrong, where they will go wrong. So all these are unknown unknowns. So how do you capture these things? How do you make sense of these things? How can this lead to better understanding of your app? That is what observability is all about. So now I'll give you an analogy if this is a little abstract. To give you an analogy, let's assume you are at a traffic signal. Four roads are uh, joining at that signal. And uh, there is a police camera fitted in at that signal. Now this camera is not that dumb camera. It has some sensors. It has some smartness. So what, but camera is programmed in a set manner. So what the camera, it has only one logic. If there is a red light and a vehicle, you know, doesn't obey the red light, switch on the camera and take a picture, right? So the so it is kind of a known unknown. The hypothesis is any, any vehicle going through a red signal, it's, it's a bad thing and I want to switch on the camera and take a picture. So the whole system is programmed for known unknowns. That means a vehicle going through a red signal. So now that is the case of monitoring. You are monitoring a specific type of failure, and if that failure occurs, you know exactly what to do. You will switch on the camera, take a picture, send a notification to the local traffic police. So all that is well understood. Now coming to observability, what can make this traffic junction observable? Now let's talk about other kind of very unexpected scenarios. Suppose there is heavy rain. Suddenly there is a huge jam, or a vehicle has broken down for some reason. Now that is creating chaos at the traffic junction. 
or a VIP is coming. So for the purpose of the VIP, the east west uh, lanes are all blocked. We are only allowing traffic in north south direction. That too, only one lane specifically for the VIP. So all other vehicles are waiting. Now, these are all very unexpected scenarios, right? You don't know what kind of vehicle has broken down, how much rain, what, 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 what kind of problem the rain is causing. Is there an accident? Which lane is having the accident? What kind of problem it is causing to the other lanes? So all these are uh, not known in advance. So this is what we mean by unknown. Unknowns. So now what can make this traffic light signal observable? Right. So the key thing here is you have to create collect lots of data of, of what is happening at the traffic signal. You don't know what is going to happen. You don't know what kind of failure is going to happen, but you can collect a lot of data to make it observable. So now I want to ask the audience what kind of data you will collect at the traffic signal to make it observable. Remember what is observability? You should be able to debug any problem with that data. Even though that problem is very new, you have not seen it before. So now given this traffic junction, what kind of data can you collect to make it observable? This is the question I want to put to the audience. Any anyone can answer. Can you please uh, read your the question? So at the traffic signal, already there is a camera, but the camera can capture only one thing that a vehicle is going through a red signal. So that is a monitoring system. We want to make the system observable. That means any kind of problems we should be able to debug. We don't know what kind of problem will occur in the traffic signal. I gave you a few examples. So now the question for you is, Let's assume you are uh, you have lots of sensors. You can collect data from the traffic signal. So what kind of things you will collect? Uh, the vehicle number. I mean the vehicle which has uh, pa uh, gone okay, past. That is, uh, uh, yeah, OK, that is OK. That is too. Uh, yeah, that is good, but OK, next. Yeah, and, yeah. and the next step would be to send a uh, like uh, message to that person. Uh, like no, no, I'm not talking about uh, this known unknowns, like a vehicle going through a red signal. No doubt uh, the current camera itself will capture the number plate and it will send the notification. It may be even integrated with the RTO office, so it knows the address of the person, email ID. It may send a notification directly. I am talking about unknown unknowns. So what so, are the things you need to capture in this case? So we, we can place sensors so that they can uh, inform the, the nearest department uh, about let's okay. say that there is a weather change like rain is falling and then we can have sensors to uh, capture cluster of images like let's say that uh, in a normal traffic flow, the if if the camera at the signal captures image of vehicles being uh, passed. So usually, if the traffic is normal, then the uh, image images will have you know uh, there will not there will not be much stagnation on that lane. But let's say that okay, uh, I understand what you are trying to say. I will translate that to more useful metrics or what kind of things you can create uh, collect. So let's assume that uh, somebody said uh, capture the number plate of the car or vehicle. That is OK. But a more important metric is let's say when the vehicle is entering the traffic junction and when it is exiting. These two times are very important because if you look at the difference between this, this will tell you the waiting time. How long the vehicle waited at the traffic junction, correct? So that is one of the things I will collect. If you have to ask me this question to make this traffic junction observable, I will collect the timestamp when the vehicle entered the junction. That means it is stopped at the junction because of the signal or because of traffic when it exited the junction. I will also collect logs when the signal changed, when it changed from green to uh, red or amber, amber to red and so on. Those kind of logs also I will collect. Somebody talked about rainfall. Yes, I will collect rainfall information through cameras or through some other means. I will collect rainfall information. Next thing I will collect is lanes. 
So I may want to know when a guy is moving from one lane to another. Now I don't know whether this information will be useful or not, but I have a hunch because I am an experienced traffic engineer. I have some sort of hunch that people, when they are at a traffic junction, when they are crossing appositely from one lane to another, it causes problems. So I know this from my experience. So because of that experience, I am telling my people, look, this is something you have to collect. That means if a vehicle crosses from changes lanes at a traffic junction, collect the data, record that in the log, right? So these are some of the things. Next thing I might want to log, what type of vehicles are entering and what lanes they are entering. It may be that uh, PMTC bus, which is taking a lot of space, it is entering the rightmost lane when it is supposed to be in the leftmost lane. Right? So then later on in the log, when you go and debug, you may find the scenario. Okay, this is a this is not conforming to the expected pattern. What is the expected pattern? We expect large vehicles or BMTC buses to be present only on the leftmost lane. But when you go and study the logs, you will find that this bus is suddenly it is appearing in the rightmost lane. So this kind of data only makes a system more observable. That means you should instrument your code in such a way that you can analyze all these events after that event has occurred. Because in production, yeah, right? See, if you have, if you integrate AI into the system, you can probably predict things before they happen. But let's assume, keep it simple. Let's assume that the, some event has already occurred. Your job as an engineer is to find out the root cause of that. So now what will help you? Lots of logs will help you. Lots of other kind of metrics will help you. And the ability to trace the event to the root cause of the problem. Right? That, that is also important. So for example, at the traffic junction, suppose there is an accident. So that is an event that has occurred in the system. Now if the system is observable, you can go and look at all the logs before the accident and you can find out what is the root cause that that caused this accident. Now, if you now coming out of the analogy, if you have to go back and look at uh, our own system, computer systems, an API request came, but somewhere else in your application, one of the services threw an exception. That service tried to access the database for some reason database refused connection or you know the schema was not matching whatever it may be reason application did not get the data it threw an exception so exception has come up in your log but by knowing looking at that exception you cannot figure out what you may get some idea what has gone wrong but you will not know who has triggered it how did it come to this level so then you have to trace it you know this service was called from another service that service was called by API Gateway. API Gateway was called by this user action on this particular web page. So that is what we mean by traceability, tracing, right? So all these things have to come into place to make a system observed. So we have, a, so that brings me to the next point, which is, which are the key pillars of observability? These are the three key pillars. Logs. We just spoke about logs in detail. We gave an anal analogy of traffic junction. What kind of things you have to collect? So logs are the most important things in the observability stack. The more logs you collect, the better it is for you later on. When something goes wrong and you have to do analysis, logs only we give, give you detailed information. Why logs are important? Because they record individual data points. They are not summarizing things. Everything that happens in the system is recorded. So they give very detailed information of what is happening step by step. Then we have metrics. So metrics are not collected uh, like logs. It's not an individual measure. It is a summary. It's an aggregation. So for example, if I say, you know, what is the queue size? I will not be measuring queue size every second. Or I will not be recording the queue size every second. What I may do is record the queue size once a minute or once in five minutes and record that aggregate. So those aggregates only will be stored in your system. Or take, for example, CPU utilization. 
right? So again, you will not record it continuously. You will take an aggregate. Let's say you take an average over a five minute window. That average, you record it in your, as part of your uh, logging framework or metric collection framework. So like this, there are so many metrics which are useful, right? So I've given some examples here, uptime, CPU utilization, system load, memory usage, throughput, response time, error rate, and so on, right? So in our case, uh, yeah, so these are some of the examples of met metrics that we can collect. Then the last thing is traces. So traces I already explained when some event occurs, how can you trace it back to a sequence of API calls that led to that event, right? So that is the whole purpose of tracing. So you have to do these three things to make your system observable and you have to do it correctly, right? To make, make them uh, effective. So three things, logs, metrics, tracing. Now in the world of monitoring, mostly people focused only on metrics. They did not, uh, in fact, tracing was never there in the world of monitoring because there was no need to explain things. The main purpose of the old style monitoring was collect metrics, compare it against expected values. If it doesn't match, throw up alerts. They also used to collect logs, but uh, yeah, you know, you know, monitoring generally, the SNMP style monitoring and uh, other kinds of systems like Nagios style monitoring, we're all focused on metrics. That is why we say here, monitoring tells you when something is wrong. Observ observability lets you ask why. So this why is the key word here because observability is all about understanding your system, analyzing your system. It's all about analysis and finding out what caused the problem. Why something occurred. Okay. So that is the basis of, uh, that is the difference between monitoring and observability. So I will pause here, any questions? See, there are other terms people use, events, exceptions. Some people treat them also as important pillars of observability, but fundamentally these are all special cases of logs, right? So logs themselves will capture exceptions. They will also capture events. See, log itself is nothing but capturing individual events. But some systems, they may segregate logs as application logs or logs that uh, capture certain network related events or infrastructure related events. So those could be treated as events. For example, a pod has go gone down. That could be treated as event. Whereas a log is something that application logs from inside the code base. So that could be treated as a log, but without going into that level of segregation, we can simply consider events exceptions. They are also logs. Then there are others who identify dependencies also as another pillar. So what are dependencies? See a microservice architecture has many components. Some components depend on other components. Like one microservice will depend on the database layer. Without database, it will not work. So you can treat that as a dependency. So dependency, it's also important for observability that you understand all the dependencies in your system, right? So some take this also as a, another uh, kind of uh, pillar for observability. Any questions at this point before we move on? So, oh, yeah, anyone? Otherwise we can come back later. Okay, now let's look at the pipeline for observability. This is nothing new. I think uh, this kind of pipelines are there in so many other fields, including uh, machine learning. So particular to observability, see you have multiple services which are part of your app. Each service is doing logging. We'll come to it and we'll look into the details how this logging can be done. But uh, let's take it for now that uh, each service is doing its own logging. And these all these logs are stored along with the service instance, but uh, that is not going to be useful for us because as you know, service can come, go down anytime. So it is therefore important to collect all these logs and store them in a central place. 
So that is what collecting of logs is all about in a microservice environment. That means from all the different services, you collect the logs into a central place. And because you have this advantage of centralization, you can do certain stuff on this logs in a unified manner. So when I say logs, I'm using the term loosely. It also means logs, metrics, and uh, anything related to tracing data. So all three, when I say logs, I mean all three. So then you can pre-process that data and uh, you, there are different ways in which you can pre-process. Typically you can clean the data. Maybe some logs are corrupted, so you will not save them in the storage. You will straight away drop them or you some specific way you can clean it or you can format the data, right? In some systems, aggregation can also happen here. So let's assume that, for example, one of the services, it is sending CPU utilization every second, right? Or every minute it is sending. But you don't want to store that value every minute. You want to aggregate it over five minutes and store a single value for a five minute window. That kind of aggregation can also happen here as part of the pre processing. So after everything is done, after the pre-processing is done, it goes into storage. So the reason for this pre-processing is one more reason is there. You don't want to store often raw data. You want to store data in a way which makes it easier for the analysis or the analytic tools to work on that data. Because here you will run queries. It may be a SQL type, type of queries or some other style of querying, doesn't matter. So there could be visualization tools, all sorts of tools will be here on this end of the analysis spectrum. So these tools should be able to query the storage in a easy manner. So storing raw data is not the best way. That is one more reason why people pre-process the data. So that the way you pre-process, the, the way it is stored, it is closer to what these guys can uh, efficiently process. So that is another reason why we do this. Then the final part of the pipeline, perhaps where all this is leading to is analysis. Because without analysis, there is no meaning to observability. You may collect any amount of data and claim that your system is observable. But if you don't use any of that data, you don't know how to use it effectively, then observability is basically moot. You are not doing it correctly. So analysis is very important and analysis takes many forms. There are so many different things on which you can analyze the logs that you have collected. So here I have listed some of the types of analysis. You can have timeline analysis, service dependency analysis, aggregation analysis, root cause analysis, anomaly detection, and so on. And much of this is powered by the use of statistics which people from the machine learning field will also be familiar. Uh, rules, the use of rules, then visualization. So you have a lot of uh, tools out there to do these kind of things. And more and more people are adopting what is known as AI ops. So you have heard this term in so many different ways. First we had DevOps, then DevSecOps, GetOps, and all kinds of new things came. So one more to that mix is AI ops. That means using observability as a general principle and machine learning as an additional uh, you know, tool in your toolbox. Can you optimize the operations of your network, uh, of your services? Can you uh, kind of make them more efficient, reduce uh, losses, reduce uh, downtime, quickly react to problems? So that is what uh, you know. AI ops is trying to. Without involving human intervention, can you solve problems automatically? So that is what AI ops is all about. And again, AI ops is powered by observability. Because without data, it cannot do much. It needs data. So that's why people are putting a lot of focus on observability. OK. So I just talked about uh, the process of collection, uh, process of uh, logging, collection, pre-processing, and finally analysis. Now let's look at logging itself as a separate thing. So how do you actually collect logs from your service? 
this is a question which some of you may already know the answer especially if you are a developer but if you are not there are basically two ways one is called uh, agentless uh, log collection or, or yeah log collection you can say the other is use an agent to collect the logs so basically what will happen see your service don't view, view it as a monolithic entity you can think of it as a kubernetes pod for example in that pod there is one main container running your service your main application code there is another container whose task is only to collect the logs so that kind of a pattern in a microservice is called a sidecar pattern so you have a main container running the application then you have a sidecar container whose only purpose is to collect logs so now the sidecar container you can treat it as an agent so let's say your service is throwing out logs to a log file what this guy will do this container this container will read from that log file and then it will send push those logs to this centralized collection that is one way of implementing the other way of implementing is the main container directly communicates to the logging container sidecar container what is the mechanism of communication there are dozens of mechanisms right you can use redis queues you can use kafka queue and there could be many other ways in which you can transfer data from one service to another so we will not worry about how you know that kind of communication happens but importantly there is another container so called agent who is tasked with collecting the logs from that service and pushing the log to the centralized logging platform the other mechanism is agentless so in a agentless way of collecting logs your service is just running there is no separate service to collect logs no separate container to collect logs right service code itself has has been integrated with a logging library so if you are in dotnet for example you may use a library called serilog if you are in java spring boot you may use a logging framework like log4j so that those api calls are directly made from within your service code so you are directly logging and pushing it into the centralized uh, collection so broadly these are the two ways in which logging can happen either you do a agentless or with an agent so both have their pros and cons so just to give you a snapshot uh, agentless is easier to deploy because you don't have to worry about another container and you don't have to worry about service to service communication all the logging happens from inside your main service only thing only problem with the agentless logging is now your developers have to take care of putting this logging code into their service code right i have a question and it kind of uh, it kind of uh, like i mean uh, previously also it was there but now they have to, uh, they have to look into the pushing aspect as well they are not, not just logging to the file but pushing the logs to the collector so there is no separate agent to abstract away that kind of functionality so there are pros and cons of both approaches any questions at this point yes sir i have a question so let's say we are using some of the tool uh, for collection of uh, logs maybe that kind that tool may be uh, open telemetry and then when usually the uh, process is like uh, the logs are connect, collected via open telemetry and then uh, given to uh, prometheus or any other kind of uh, tools so uh, telemetry will have its own api so uh, as developers like should we directly uh, collect like we anyways uh, put down logs but then uh, how how putting up logs manually is different from like uh, using telemetry for logging how, yeah. how does it benefit us yeah it is a good question so there are standard uh, implementations open telemetry for example is a open standard and uh, if you adopt to open telemetry then uh, it is uh, there are libraries that will directly integrate with your application code 
and those libraries if you enable the logging it will automatically log every service see what 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 is the main thing we want to log when another service makes a api call to this service we want to log that right and along with yes. the logging we will naturally log all the different parameters of that uh, api request so that kind of thing as this gentleman pointed out automatically it will done be done you don't have to write any code specifically for that purpose because every service has an entry point for the api call and uh, if you have properly integrated that application code with the logging framework which let's say supports open telemetry then automatically that service api call will be logged so you don't have to as a developer need to carefully instrument your code in many other ways right so at a service level if you are only wanting to log api calls that is enough but then the general best practice is that is not enough to make your system observable because service api logging the api calls alone will give you only some picture it will not give you complete picture as of what is going on inside your service right so inside your application code you may put out many other logging things which are not available for your for your general uh, auto automated uh, logging that comes from uh, libraries that support open telemetry so uh, yeah as a conclusion yes they are complementary you have to have both yes, any other questions that is a good question yes I have a question here. So some of these things I have captured here. What are the best practices? Right. Yeah, go ahead. You had a question. Yeah. Uh, let's say I have a, a product which I'm developing for a healthcare platform. And every every data which I deal with in the API is a very sensitive data. So in that case, how that logging is going to be act like a, a kind of like uh, how that can be a, a stopper to claim that my 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 system is like a complete privacy and other thing because i'm logging the customer name or something which is which is which is sensitive right so please please okay enter. so that i don't have an answer uh, so probably uh, what i can think of is uh, this is just my view of things so the thing is if you have to see definitely you don't want to mess with your service code right so you log the way you log other things normally even though they are sensitive data you log it as if they are not sensitive but in pre processing they can be handled properly that means in pre processing you will not store sensitive data directly into storage you will either anonymize it or you will encrypt it and store it so that in storage you know, anyone who gets hold of the storage they will not be able to view the raw data the actual plain text what they will see is encrypted data now this translates to the analysis so only those tools or users who have the permissions or authority to decrypt the data can do the analysis mm -hmm. so yeah, this is my right. idea that means we will not touch anything we will not change anything here neither at the service level or logging level or the collector level but from pre processing onwards it will be different for sensitive data either they have to be encrypted or they have to un be anonymized if that is uh, permitted in your app mm -hmm. and then uh, the same protection will continue right up to the analysis stage yeah that that helps yeah okay any further questions Okay, so now uh, coming to the design patterns, what are the various ways in which microservices observability is possible? So some of these are very intuitive. Uh, so application metrics from inside your application also you can uh, collect metrics. So typically when we talk about metrics in the traditional sense, we collect uh, mainly about the infrastructure. When I mean what I mean by infrastructure is, let's say, what is the CPU utilization on the server? What is the RAM usage on the server? Uh, or for example, if you are looking at a network device or a web server, how many requests per second are being served? Those kind of uh, metrics, right? Uh, 
okay application infrastructure is limited to those things memory usage cpu but we go beyond that we look at metrics from the application perspective so what do i mean by application let's say for some reason you have some sort of a queue inside your application queue or buffer whatever you want to call it and for a good performance from your application that queue should never be 100% full it should be uh, ideally less than 90% full. So this kind of metric you can collect. This is very specific to your application. Right? Infrastructure will not capture or neither end user. This is something internal to your application. So you have to instrument it to capture this kind of metric. Only you will know as an application developer what is what could be a useful metric that can help you later when debugging problems. Right? So the reason I gave this buffer size is today uh, uh, I am working on a 5G uh, core network uh, product. So that is designed as microservices. So one of the things in a 5G network is when user is downloading, packets are going through one of the microservices. So because it is user data, there is definitely a queue to store that data. And the size of the queue creates an impact on the overall throughput for performance. How much? download throughput the user is experiencing. So this we have seen uh, in our uh, 5G core when we are developing that. But imagine if this matrix is now collected upfront and it is made available to your observability tools. Then later on in production, when suddenly one day somebody, some user or some customer complains that in uh, that he is not getting the desired throughput when he starts downloading YouTube video. I, I can immediately look at this metric because I have a suspicion. Is it because of this? Is it because of that? Right? So I ask these questions, but only my data, which I thankfully I have instrumented my code like that. My data can tell me whether those conditions are the possible causes for that failure. End user metrics would be things like uh, uh, what shall we say? Yeah, things like the purchasing. Let's say the user ended up on some landing page or on some discount page, let's say. And on that discount page, clearly a button is given add to shopping cart. But did the user actually click that? So those are end user metrics. That means tracking exact interactions. Right, so your application metrics should not be limited to just infrastructure. So today for observability, people monitor infrastructure, networking, application, all three aspects. Audit logging, this is just a special case of logging, right? Suppose as a user, I change some settings. So those kind of ch changes to settings should also be logged, right? So th that is also important. To give you an example, let's say again, let's take an example of a 5G subscriber. So suddenly subscriber calls customer support and asks, you know, you know, I am not, uh, see, I consumed only 1.5 GB of data today, but you are telling me that I already exhausted my data plan for today. My plan is supposed to be 2 GB. But it might so happen that the customer forgot that he uh, change the plan only temporarily for a 15 day period. So once that period ex uh, elapsed, it went back to the old plan 1.5 GB per day. Right? So those kind of setting changes will be part of the audit log. And there is a already a well known technique called event sourcing. To capture these kind of audit logs. So this is not something we can cover today. This is part of another talk potentially. Uh, distributed tracing is the big thing. So the thing about distributed tracing is that uh, when an API call comes, like let's say triggered by some user request, let's say we have uh, given an example here, user request comes in. This triggers a chain of uh, requests or API calls to multiple services. First uh, request may go to an API gateway for some processing. Then uh, from API gateway, it may go to Sing one or more services for processing. 
some of those services may make uh, database calls some services may make api calls to external services so all kinds of things can happen the question is can you trace all these things to the original source of the you know the whole chain of events so that is what tracing is all about why we call it distributed tracing obviously because now we are not doing tracing on a monolithic application where it is as simple as looking at the call stack you put a breakpoint you will get a call stack and that call stack will tell you the chain of calls from one function to another but here it is distributed so you cannot put a breakpoint in one process and figure out what is going on in some other service somewhere else so this is what it is so how to do this so for this the uh, main technique is that they generate what is known as a context id or a correlation id when the user request first comes in this id is generated and this id is passed along to every service along the chain now when you start logging all these api calls all these logs contain this id now easily in your analysis tools or visualization tools you can simply filter by this id and find the chain of calls that led to this sequence of action that was triggered by a single api call so that is what this diagram is telling us right the user gave a request it is nothing but a http request client to server but then this triggered a chain of other calls api gateway call service call database call and so on and with each call this point the point on the left is when the database was triggered then the database took so much time to come back with the reply this is when it actually replied to the service right so service called the database at this point database did a bunch of things gave the response back to the service the service itself was called here by api gateway then initially the service did some processing but then later on it had to wait for the database so it started waiting when database came back the service was ready it it can also do further processing before it gives the response back to the api gateway so now each of these calls is defined as a span that is the starting point of the processing the ending point of the processing so this is defined in uh, open telemetry as a span and multiple spans together form a trace this is actually open telemetry terminology right so this is how tracing works and to standardize this one more so that is where the w3c standard came into picture so what w3c standardized is this right so we said okay we generate a common id let's say a correlation id or context id and we keep passing that id along every entity uh, to every entity that that is along this chain of interactions but now the question arises how will you pass this entity if it is not standardized how will you pass it so this problem is easily solved if you write your own application code right that means everything is handled in your application layer so let's say front end makes an api call to the web server so the api call will have let's say a dozen parameters let's assume along with the dozen parameter you add one more parameter 13th parameter which will capture the context id so likewise every api call in your system will have this extra parameter to uh, handle the context id So, so this is one way to do it, and this is the way many people have been doing it. But then the problem with this approach is now all your APIs have this extra parameter. But actually, this is not your application's concern. This is actually a concern of the logging, of observability. It is not something uh, that uh, you know API designers should be concerned about. But unfortunately, they don't have any other mechanism to pass this context ID. in this unified manner across all services so they have resorted to this approach so to solve this problem w3c standardized what is known as trace context 
So with trace contacts, no longer you need to pass these context IDs as part of your, what do you call your API? That is uh, how your application API is designed. These trace context IDs can now be passed as part of your HTTP headers. And because it is standardized, everybody along this chain, that means web server, microservices, basically every web server, every HTTP server should honor the trace ID because it is standardized. It cannot simply discard the ID. Whereas previously what used to happen, you know, people used different frameworks or different tools, uh, observability tools in their product, in their uh, deployment. So whenever, uh, see to give you an example, there is a tool called Dynatrace. Then there is another tool called uh, Sumo Logic. So let's assume that uh, this product is using Sumo, this microservice is using Sumo Logic. This person, this one is using Dynatrace. So Dynatrace will instrument the uh, trace ID in a certain way, but this guy will not recognize it because it is coming from a different vendor, Sumo Logic. So he will simply discard it. That is what used to happen before. Now, because the HTTP headers are standardized, people should, uh, the implementations cannot simply discard the HTTP header. So it is passed along, which means that your logging frameworks, uh, the, later on when you start to do your analysis, trace IDs are always available. So easily you can do this distributed tracing the way we have shown it here. You can do this, right? And uh, earlier somebody made reference to open telemetry. So I just want to make a note that open telemetry now supports W3C trace context. So that means any tool which is implementing open telemetry, they can also, they also recognize and they also generate trace IDs conforming to W3C trace context. So that is a good thing. It will make for more interoperable uh, solution. So coming to the tools, already I mentioned a few tools. So there are plenty of tools in the market. You can just see the landscape here. Many familiar names. So obviously cloud providers, they have their own tools. Azure has a lot of tools, AWS has tools. Uh, but there are tools specialized for this purpose. Dynatrace, Dispose App Dynamics, Datadogs, Plunk, Sumo Logic, OpenText, IBM Instana, New Relic, NetApp, Honeycomb, Grafana Labs, right? So, so many different tools are there. And uh, not all tools do everything, right? Because we saw in our earlier use case, earlier uh, diagram, that there is a pipeline and uh, each part of the pipeline does something different. So for example, uh, let's go back to this question. So here I've captured a bunch of tools. So some, uh, some people, uh, have come up with what is known as observability stacks. Some of you might have heard these terms, ELK stack. So ELK stands for Elastic Search, Log Stash, and Kibana. But if you look at the purpose of each one, each one has a distinct purpose. Elastic Search is for analysis. Log Stash is for doing the logging. Maybe pre-processing may, might also be part of it. Kibana is for creating dashboards for visualization, right? Same thing, another possible stack is PLG, again getting popular. P is a prompt tail, which has uh, like uh, related to Prometheus. Loki for logging, Grafana for creating dashboards and visualization. Okay, and uh, like Prometheus, somebody mentioned uh, Prometheus helps with monitoring uh, containers, collection of metrics. Jager, Jager is another tool. It helps with the visualization of dependencies. So we looked at traces and spans, but if you want better visualization of those things, then Jager is another tool that you can think of. So there are frankly so many tools. I think we should not get confused about uh, which tool is better than others. 
uh, first it is important to understand you know the concept of observability how we should make our applications observable and then we can start to look at the tools right so don't start with the tools and get confused but basically observability has all three components which is logs metrics and tracing and all of them have to come together in a in any kind of tool that you select so i have given example here of how one possible deployment can be done on aws right like i said uh, you know cloud providers have their own proprietary tools but they also adopt open source tools for example they have adopted open telemetry sdks and then in this case prometheus they have adopted for metrics see this orange line is the way metrics are processed so it goes to prometheus this is what i called as pre processing filtering sampling enriching prometheus aggregation visualization right so you can say storage is also here then you have here oltp storage you can say storage is also here sorry otlp which is a short form for open telemetry so here same process but then the data is stored in uh, amazon elastic search so here aws offers prometheus as a managed service so you don't even have to install and manage prometheus if you are going to be doing it on aws AWS itself offers it as a managed service for you. Similarly, for visualization, AWS offers Grafana as a managed service. Or if you don't want Grafana, you want to adopt Kibana and other things, you can do that for tracing. Right. So here they have said for trace analytics, they are going in this example, they are using Kibana. Okay, so those kind of things are possible. So this is just one example to give you a feel, right? So we looked at it in abstract earlier. So earlier this was more like an abstract thing. This is the pipeline. But now I'm showing you a concrete implementation of how it could be done on AWS. And uh, generally nowadays cloud providers simplify the task. You don't have to install anything. Everything is available as a managed service. Only thing is they may cost more, but it's easy to as a proof of concept, it is easy. It is easy to set up and get going. OK. So that's it from my side. Uh, I will not go into the details of. Uh, maybe this is worth uh, discussing. So some of you are developers. You are not into operations, let's say. So the question will arise as a developer, should I care about observability? Isn't observability a concern of only people in operations? Or people who are more closely associated with DevOps? Should I care as a developer? The answer is yes. Because as a developer, you know your system better than the operations guys. Because like I mentioned earlier, collecting metrics from inside the system is important. So you know how your application code is written and what kind of things can possibly go wrong or what kind of things you have not planned for, right? It may be the case, like for example, it may be the case that in one bunch of code, there is some logic which you have not implemented. Let's say I'm just giving a wild idea. You have not implemented and it has to be implemented, but it is supposed to be done in a future release because your project manager has not scheduled it and is not important now. So you have left it out as it is. But you know that this part, piece of code can cause a potential problem in certain scenarios. Or let's say when your app becomes more popular, there is a chance of a race condition. There is a chance that uh, queues may overflow. So there is a chance that that bit of application logic can cause problems. So knowing that in advance, you can instrument that code as a developer. You can put some uh, statement log statement saying that under these conditions i will throw a log like this and i will say this is a warning so that is what i mean by developers have to get involved with observability it is not something that is a concern of only operations guys right 
remember this is not about uh, i'll give you a more uh, useful uh, scenario let's say you have already deployed your app app is running in production and then you encountered an error weird error you have never seen it before first time you are seeing so it is classic case of a unknown unknown and you are going through your logs you are not able to figure out but somehow few weeks later you manage to find re reproduce the problem in your own system by luck or whatever it may be or through analysis you manage to reproduce the problem in your own system and then now you became smart and then you tell okay in the next release i will put extra code in the software in my application code so that next time this kind of situation occurs my log will clearly show that this has occurred okay now i want to ask you before the person added this piece of code was the system observable right he added this bit of code to do extra logging afterwards after he noticed the problem after 2 3 weeks of debugging and finding the problem he added that extra bit of code to capture logs for future case future scenarios but before adding that piece of code was the system observable the answer is no right a system that is observable is observable by by its nature that is to say already everything is in place to make it observable the very fact that this developer couldn't catch that problem was because it was not observable he took 2 3 weeks to find the problem and that too by pure luck he must have found it or through educated guess work right the logs did not help him to find the problem so what is the conclusion the conclusion was the earlier system was not observable that means the logs at that time were not sufficient now having added the new log maybe he, uh, it is likely that he has improved the observability of that system so i hope you are trying to you understand what i am trying to say right so another thing is don't capture too many logs also right see for example when web server very often web server may, may throw this kind of 500 error 502 error now you don't want to log every single 500 error because then your log will be your logging system will be overwhelmed and uh, the usefulness of collecting logs at that level is also not great right so then you have to be more intelligent right so you you have to be a little bit more smart that means you will not log every let's say here every 500 status code you will not log or not give an alert for everyone but you will give an alert let's say you get 20 500 status code within 5 minutes then you can treat that as something serious so you have to send out an alert any questions sure any questions please so sir uh, usually uh, the business guys ask like when when we work in a company they ask like okay if we have to there is a system already and we want to implement observability or monitoring into the system they usually ask like okay what would be the cost of it and how much time it would take like if if we are not building a system from the scratch the system is already there now we want to implement uh, monitoring on top of it or observability on top of it so how effectively it can be done and uh, what would be the probable cost how to discuss that yeah actually today things are much easier than maybe 5 years ago because uh, like the other gentleman said uh, or i myself know open telemetry for example see the basically what i want to say is for every problem there is a library available somewhere either it may be a commercial library or it may be open source so i am working on dotnet there is a library called serilog which will help me to do logging then there is another bunch of libraries which will help me to adopt tele open telemetry very easily in dotnet i don't have to write much any code 
when my asp.net my service is coming up i just have to uh, write a little bit of code that is few lines of code just to configure open telemetry configure these libraries and get going so that is not so you are not doing much work all you are doing is integrating already available plugins libraries or frameworks whatever you can call it into your application code that's all you are doing and that will automatically log every service api call that comes in same thing for visualization analysis you don't have to build your own dashboards anymore because you have systems like kibana grafana with a very powerful way to do analytics so you can do all these things very quickly today if you want to take it to the next level then you have to go deeper and into your app and start instrumenting your code so that is where developers have to get involved more deeply so that will take more time so my recommendation is uh, split it into two phases the first phase of observability is to take off the shelf components and the only work you have to do is integration nothing more then the second phase of the project you know which you can take up after one or two releases is where you do deeper instrumentation of your application code to throw out more useful metrics or logs understood sir so when you say about integration that means that uh, the data which is being collected from the system is being fed forward to uh, prometheus or any other come again what is the question so when when you mention uh, about integration yeah yeah it means that the the log the data the metrics are connected from the system and then fed towards uh, the tools like prometheus for further processing yeah yeah and, yeah, yeah. Okay. you have to only install the tools configure then yeah. uh, every every tool will know where it gets the data from so grafana for example you have to configure the dashboard so it will know because you create a dashboard creating the dashboard is as simple as uh, adding a few components and configuring those components but then you have to connect that dashboard to some data source so that you have to configure in grafana so most of the work in phase 1 will be installing the tools and configuring that is it that is what i mean by integration and in your application code a few lines of code you have to write to enable those tools from inside Thank you. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. I hope you found this uh, session useful. Uh, you can read more about it in this article on Devopedia. The article is titled uh, "Microservices Observability." So, and a uh, bit of trivia for you. observability is written like this as a short form o o11 y can anybody explain why it is written like this how did this come about because people find it uh, hard to write this uh, all the time so they came up with this acronym o11 o11 y no one knows no one knows Okay. There are eleven characters between O and Y. That's very good. Uh, uh, actually, it came from here because everyone knows this. What is this? Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Short form for Kubernetes is K eight S. What they did? They deleted eight letters in between and made it a short form. Same thing they adopted for observability. they removed the eight letters in between because it's too long so they use this short form o11y so next time in any documentation you see o11y you don't get confused it is nothing but observability so this is just a bit of trivia for you and uh, if you want to more more detailed information you can uh, read this paper in further reading section the first paper you read that is published last year only so it gives a overview of observability and if you want books there is a good book on 
by written by Cindy Sridharan, Monitoring and Observability. Sorry, this is a, there is a book here. Somewhere else I've captured it. Yeah, this book, first edition by O'Reilly, Distributed Systems Observability by Sridharan. So she has written, and uh, this is easy to read because the entire book is only 36 pages or so. So this is uh, one thing I can recommend. If you want more detailed uh, reading, there is another book for that. So that, uh, I think it was published uh, last year only. It is, uh, it's called Observability Engineering or something like that. Yeah, this book by Majors, Observability Engineering. So this is a detailed book. It is freely downloadable. If you follow the link on our on that article, you can get it. So I'm talking about this book. Observability Engineering, Achieving Production Excellence. So it starts with uh, you know explaining what is observability, fundamentals, then uh, how you can put them into practice, and then how you can scale. Right. But for uh, if you are not actually working on observability, this may be an overkill. So then you can read a Sridharan's book, which is just uh, like I said, 36 pages. So this you can read in one sitting. Very simple, very easy to understand. Okay, thanks for joining. Uh, see you at our next event.